All right, has this weekend been rich and enjoyable? I've heard a lot of good things. I've been uh, quizzing my own family members on what they've heard, so it's sounded really great. Um, be thinking about questions you'd like to ask. Melissa's going to roam with the microphone, so uh, you can just put your hand up and ask. I'm going to start us off with one question, and then all of you are on deck. So, uh, Carrie and Pam, you've been married 46 years. Carrie, you were an unbeliever when you were first married. Uh, you've been through a lot of marriage. You've seen a lot of marriages. You've counseled a lot of marriages. Uh, what would be some of the keys for making 46 years work to the glory of God? Yes, 46 years. I was doing the math again just to make sure that's correct, but that is. We married when we were seven years old, and uh, so that, that is all correct. Um, 46 years, I think it's the basics. Uh, you know, a lot of things are timeless, and so when it comes to relationships, there are timeless principles, but and I don't want to be trite about this, but certainly we've had to have something outside of ourselves to focus on that would carry us, and that's the Lord. And so all that that means to, to seek to walk with the Lord, uh, that draws us out of the muck and the mire of our sin sometimes and uh, helps us to get back on the path where we need to be. On the practical level, I think it's important that, you know, you, you go into a marriage and you, you, you function in a marriage understanding that your, your goal is not to fix the other person and to change the other person. And I think that's where some go wrong. I could list several things like that, but that's one. Where they just, uh, you know, I, I must, this person must change for me to be happy. And to fix someone or to change someone is usually defined by this way, that I need to make them more like me, you know, the right way. You know, think the right way and be the right way, because I'm right. And I'm normal, so what's wrong with this other person, you know? God has given me to this other person to fix them. You know, that's my ministry. It's my spiritual gift of fixing. So uh, I know a lot of husbands struggle with that, but I'm certain wives do as well. So certainly the Lord and just um, understanding that God has created each of us certain ways, and he, we're wired certain ways. We uh, have certain personalities and certain histories that we come into marriage with, and all of that can be the source of turmoil and conflicts and disappointments, but it can also be a good thing that we, we each bring something to the table that the other person needs. And so we need to allow the Lord to do that in our lives without trying to make the other person into some, somebody that they're, they're not. I echo all that. And, yeah, I think, as you said, just understanding that there's something bigger than just our marriage. And the Lord, being committed to the Lord and wanting to honor him and glorify him, that is what transcends all the differences, all the potential conflicts, is ultimately you want to glorify God. And that does, right there, take you out of yourself and our natural selfishness of wanting to get our way. And, you know, it can be a struggle at times, but you cannot un underestimate how, much, how important that is, just understanding that we're committed to something that is bigger than either one of us, and that is just the honor of the Lord, and that's a deal breaker. Yeah, let me add that that's true even if both are not understanding that. So I, I know the reality of life is that there can be a marriage where only one side is pursuing Christ and, and loving the Lord and, and seeking to walk with the Lord and understanding those things. So does that mean that that doesn't apply to that marriage? No, it still applies. It applies to that one. And so I'm not going to tell someone that they'll have all the same joy that another couple might have and who both love the Lord. That's not going to be true. But they can have the joy of pleasing the Lord. And so they can pursue Christ, and they can grow closer to the Lord, and they can be drawn out of the muck and mire of sin in their own lives 
uh, that pleases the Lord, and they can learn the joy of that, even if they're missing uh, the other half of that, and they long for that for their spouse uh, as well. So that part doesn't change. Thank you. Melissa, what time are we done with this session officially? 2.30. Okay. So if you have a question. Oh, we don't know that much because I'm looking at the clock. <laughs> so we got a problem. pretty quick. Okay. While they're thinking about questions, do, am I allowed to ask for follow-up, fuller details about stories from your book? Sure. Rafting trips and oh. things like that. Sure. Is there a question out there? Okay. We want to hear about a rafting trip and how that went over. Are you serious? I'm serious. Oh, okay. The rafting trip. Uh, well, that was a long time ago. Yeah, that was, yeah, a long time ago. We were on a church outing with some people from our church in Texas, and we were on the, uh, the Guadalupe River, which is a big recreation river in Texas. I think there were teenagers probably, youth, older youth that we were with. Yes, we were with probably, the, yeah, the youth department. We were in our 20s. That's why we can't even remember it. It was so long ago. Um, but we were on this river, and we're in a big raft, and it's meant to hold probably about eight or ten people. So we are floating quietly down this river, having a great time, and we missed something. We never were quite sure. It was we a were fork in the to, river that we didn't we understand that we should have gone way. left. I'm not sure how we did it, but we got on the wrong side. So we are um, floating down the river, and as we're enjoying this experience, all of a sudden we see people on the, sh the shore that are waving at us, and they're going, you know, they're getting increasingly frantic, you know. And so we start sitting up going, okay, this is really messing up our quiet, lazy drift down the river what why are they doing that so we kept going the water is carrying us down and a, then we heard a sound like a waterfall it was that kind of sound and we begin we couldn't see it but again there's more people now waving at us frantically and we're realizing we are headed for a drop the eight to ten people, however many, were it in this It was a raft. dam is what it was. And so it was it a concrete dam about, dam about five foot tall, five or six foot tall. I think it was 40, 50 it, feet. It the way felt I remember like it. that. But, and so we, we hear it coming. We can't see it. And so when we got there, we just, I think we all just got in the middle of the raft, and we are just... Holding on to our ice chest, whatever we could do. We're just holding down, and, and when the, we went over... It folded over, like a taco. It did. Uh, it folded like a taco as we went over, and we all got quite drenched, and it was quite a drop as we dropped down in there, and then there's the the rapids and the churning water. there's the water. danger of kind of getting sucked back under the dam, you know, because of all that. So yeah. we're trying to get away. And um, we, all... we survived. That was it. Um, nobody fell out, which was quite a miracle. And afterwards, because we all lived, we thought it was really funny. If somebody had not lived, it would not have been funny. If we had gotten caught. Still a that... good story, though. I mean, even if they hadn't <laughs> lived. <laughs> but anyway, but that was the thing. And so, yes, it is a illustration I used it in the book as an illustration of you're just floating along, everything's perfect, you're just laid back, and all of a sudden, no warning, you go over that waterfall and that dam, and all of a sudden, you've got trouble in your life that you didn't expect, and you just have to survive it. So that was the story. We were young and foolish, so hey. And we gave the people on the shore a great laugh. Yeah. Um, it's kind of uh, inspired by a conversation I was having this morning and something you had talked about, um, discipling your children. Um, how do you have any practical ways to, that you spent individual time with your four kids? Um, and 
and really be intentional with them? Or did you, do you just spend time with everybody together? Yeah. How did you pour into your children and meet their needs in, in like a spiritual way? I guess? We did all the normal things that parents seek to do and there's no silver bullet, but I think it's all the above, you know, it's, you want to be intentional about things. And so depending on the ages of the children, we, we did different things intentional as far as family time and family worship time and discussion time, uh, looking at Bible verses, dinner discussions. And, and as we had more children, our oldest and our youngest were 10 years apart. And so the, you know, it became more challenging in those times to, to talk about some things and have discussions and, and, and the, which night of the week or what day. All those had to flex and change through the years. You have to be very flexible and realize there's, there's no wrong or right thing about that. I think the, you just need to be intentional. The Lord honors that. And it pleases him. And so, yeah, we did different things when they were little. And as they got older, we would add on uh, other kinds of uh, things that we would do as a family. I, I think the things we remember most were, for a while, it was breakfast. Uh, that seemed to be the best, the best time for all of us. And we had uh, just some discussions right before we would eat and, and just for a few minutes. And I might just discuss one, one verse from Proverb and ask them, what they think, you know, how that applies or whatever, and you get different answers at different levels of kid. And we would teach our younger ones uh, to say something, you know, because they would hear the older ones answering the questions, and and the, the youngest one would be, you know, two years old, you know, and they see the other kids raising their hand, and so you look over there, and there's the two-year-old raising their hand, and it's like, eh, ignore him, you know. But then you realize, yeah, I, I tell him to say something. So we started out, I, I told each of the younger ones, I told them the, the first thing they, they learned to say in the Q&A was love God. And so it didn't matter what we were talking about. There Luke would have his hand up, you know, and so I'd call on Luke, so what would you like to say? You know, love God. Good, that's very good, you know, and we would do that. And then the day, you do, you, the day comes where you... All of a sudden, months have gone by, and, and you're talking about something, and you, you give him that opportunity. He's got his hand raised, and what would you like to say, Luke? And all of a sudden, he says a different answer, and it has to do with something you talked about. It's like, wow, that was good. And so you realize they're listening. They learn. And so we did those, and then breakfast didn't work anymore, and we, we'd have some dinner discussions, uh, you know, maybe two nights a week. You have to keep your expectations reasonable based on where you are in your life and the busyness. So those kind of family times we did. We were intentional about church. But in addition to that, it's the, the milieu of life. Frankly, I really believe those were the most important times, really. Being in the milieu of life and using struggles at school or struggles with their buddies at church and conflict with siblings and the trials they go through. It's those things of life that you bring truth to bear on their situation, you need to talk to them about it, and you pray with them about it, what's going on, and, and uh, you teach them what it means to trust the Lord again through these difficult times. You take them with you around, you know, to go places, and um, so really, both and, the short answer. Yeah, I think, and there were times when, like, you would take the kids to breakfast, you would take one child to breakfast, and... I can remember going through a devotional book with at least one of my daughters that was specifically made for mothers and daughters. So once a week we would go to get coffee and talk over some, uh, you know, the next question. It, you could read little chapters and then they had questions. And that was really a good one. I enjoyed that one. I think she was in high school. That was, I remember, with my youngest daughter and she was in high school. And it just gives you an opportunity to bring up things to them and talk about it. Um, I will recommend a resource that we didn't have, but I have noticed, I mean, I've become familiar with it in the last six to eight years, I guess, and I would recommend this. You could look it up. It's a book called The Discipling Parent, and it's by a guy named Chap Bettis, B-E-T-T-I-S, and that is his whole ministry is discipling our children. And I think he's pretty solid. Um, he also has a little book called Donut Dates, and it's kind of the same thing that he used to do, taking the kids to breakfast. Um, he says, take them for donuts or for coffee. 
but he gives you a whole book that is full of good questions, worldview questions, just things that will stimulate good discussions with them. Um, I think uh, one of the things I think we could have done better is just to listen more. I think as parents, we tend probably to talk more than we should and maybe not listen as much as we should. So I think that's something I would work harder at is just listening. Let them talk. Um, and you want to keep the communication open. That is a prime goal, whether your kids are 5 or 15 or 25 or 35. Okay, you want to keep communication open. Um, and one thing that will help that, and this is an overarching, just a point to keep in mind with parenting. Many parents struggle the most when their children are failing in some way. You know, they, they, they want to do all these right things and impact their children for the kingdom and to be good citizens and, and not be, you know, uh, you know, moral reprobates and all that, you know. And so you do all these good things and then your children keep failing along the way. They keep exemplifying selfishness or impatience or, or whatever it might be. And, and, and you, parents can, can feel guilty over that. I'm not doing enough. I'm not doing the right thing. And my child's still dealing with selfishness. I thought we dealt with that last year. Why is he still selfish? And you realize, well, listen, those times of failure actually are opportunities. Don't get destroyed over those. Those are actually your greatest opportunities, I think, for the gospel. I think parents can be deluded into thinking that all these good things we're doing, we're shaping the child into a Christian. Listen, regeneration is totally disconnected from that. It's in God's sovereign uh, design of how he does that and when he does that. And so these are all good things to do, but the gospel is not about them conforming and becoming better and better. The gospel is realizing their hopelessness. And so in those moments of failures, you have the most profound opportunities to actually, at an age-appropriate level, to begin to discuss why, why they struggle with that. What's going on in the heart? It's the same thing that's going on in my heart, why I needed a Savior. You know, it's true for Daddy, too, and, and for Mommy. And so cherish those times. Don't, don't be exasperated. Uh, look at them as opportunities. Redefine them. Pam, you mentioned parenting at 35, and I thought I was off the hook a little sooner than that. Um, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Uh, by that time, yes, you are not running their life, but you still need, again, just to be available, you need, still need to keep, keep them talking to you, no matter, again, how old they are. Um, I've used this example. This was several years ago, and I was texting back and forth with my youngest daughter, and we were having a friendly difference of opinion, okay, on some issue. I can't even remember what it was now, but we had gone back several times, and we just, we didn't see something quite the same, but I remember her last text to me said, Mom, I'm so glad I can talk to you, and I thought, Thank you, Lord. That is everything. If she still feels like she can at least talk to me, that I won't shut her down even when we don't agree or I'm not in agreement with something she's doing or saying, she still knows she can talk to me. And that is huge because your relationship is what you can possibly use to influence them, okay? So be very careful, no matter what their age, that you don't cut them off or just always be negative, always be, um, you know, disagreeing with what they want to do. I know he's said something through the years, which is so true. Say, as a parent, say yes as much as you can so your no means something. If you really need to say no, it's going to carry some weight. But if you say no to everything, no, you can't do that. No, you can't listen to that kind of music. No, you can't read that. No, you can't do this. It's just kind of human nature. They'll start tuning you out because everything is a no. So I think we have to allow them wisely, hopefully, some kind of freedom along the way. You need 
to allow them some freedom and see what they do with it. Um, and that's why you can't, uh, it's so hard. Believe me, I'm, I'm giving you the right answer, but not, not something we were always perfect in at all. To respond to their failures with a sense of, of understanding and grace, you can be firm and yet not be just so frustrated and exasperated that the message is, you've, you've messed up my life. You know, you've disappointed me. You are bringing turmoil into my life. I must have gotten the wrong kid at the hospital or something, you know, when you were a baby because I did not order this when I put my order in, okay? You can come across that way. And, and yes, you've got to be firm. You've got to, to take sin seriously and all that. So what a, what a, what a balance it is <laughs> to be able to, uh, with God's grace, uh, to be firm and yet gracious and to still be able to talk to them and to keep that communication open uh, to reason with them along the way. And that is what you're going to need when, they're, when you're parenting and the, they're in their late 20s and 30s and 40s. You're, you're still, still a parent at some level. Yeah. Sorry, Smed, you're not off the hook for quite a while. Question. Um, I remember you said that you homeschooled. What did your ministry look like as your kids were in school? And when did you write your book? I guess it's two questions, but. When our children were, were younger, what, what level of ministry was she able to carry on? Because she was a mother, she was homeschooling and all the business of that. What did ministry look like? And then when did you write the book? When all uh, the kids were like kindergarten and babies, no, you wrote that no. book? No. I wrote the book when they had been long gone. Believe me, they've been, <laughs> they've been out of them. Our youngest is 28, so and I didn't write the book till two years ago. So I was thinking about it before then. But um, we homeschooled for 12 years. Uh, again, I had a one-year break that I wasn't homeschooling anyone. And we did use it, just very informal ministry. I remember one year... We had a big uh, poster on the wall, a big chart, and we picked uh, scripture verses to memorize together, and we all got gold stars, me too, uh, with the kids, when we would memorize the scriptures. Um, we have several scriptures just in uh, frames on our wall, and I remember we kind of memorized a couple of rooms worth of scripture. So that was just something fun we could do, and we did that together. We would always, I think, when we started, usually say a very simple prayer to open up the day. You know, it was all very low-key and not super structured. I was using a Christian curriculum, so, you know, some of the reading stories and all that had Christian messages. But I did my best to just make it kind of a, a natural thing. You don't want it to be artificial, that you're just beating them over the head with doctrine and stuff. You just want it to be natural, just like you want your discussions with them, like he was talking about the milieu of life. You just want it to be very natural when you talk about God, and we love him, we trust him, God is the creator. We just want that to be very normal, everyday conversation. It's not that every conversation is about that, but as parents, we need to talk normally and naturally about God. How, how does God see this? I think you're building a God consciousness in them, trying to teach them as they go through life to always be filtering that through, what does God think about this? What would God have me do? It's just kind of a reference point back to God. How did you, help me remember, you know, it was so many years ago, how did you do all that and you did wonderful at it? You had more time with the children just practically than I did, mm. yet I was uh, involved in the church and everything else. You were involved. How did you balance all of that with um, serving in the church? What was your ministry? How did you view ministry, I guess, in those years? Well, my main ministry was absolutely to my children especially when they were little, you know. And I, like the teaching, I never taught anything to groups of ladies or anything till probably our youngest was, I would say, 10 or 11. I never did 
any teaching. Um, I was busy with them supporting, you know, I was homeschooling. Um, we were very busy in the church. I taught piano. Um, so there was a lot in our lives. So I did not have time to write a book, I promise. But... Um, so how did I fit in with all that? Okay. I mean, you fit did, in. <laughs> I'm just thinking about your role as a wife no. here in ministry. Because I'm, I'm pretty needy, you know? I mean, I have, I'm, a, I'm high maintenance. So how did you, how did no. you handle that? No, he, you know, we did do this. When he would come home at night, for one thing, he always kind of led our very simple, not big, long discourses, simple little devotionals, whether we did it at breakfast for several years or just a very simple uh, little Bible thing at dinner. And he always led that. Now, we did different things. I typed up um, some of our favorite hymns and songs, and they all had folders. We would put those out, and they all took turns choosing. We would sing a little song. We did that for a while, and they got to choose theirs. Um, one year, I remember we did Proverbs, and I, again, gave them just, I typed up little um, things and put them in folders of Proverbs on certain subjects, like we had, what is like Proverbs? Char character traits and things like character that. Character traits. What, uh, what is the Bible, what is the you know, Proverbs say about work? What does it say about friends? What does it say about anger? What does it say about pride? Just different things. But he always, I wanted the kids to see him as leading that, especially once he came home, um, you know, just intentionally trying to convey to them that he is the father, he's the leader, and so he would usually lead those discussions. Um, when it came to discipline, same sort of thing. And this is very hard as mothers because with the dads gone all day, the, the wife gets used to doing a lot of the discipline. But I did try as much as I could to punt to him, okay, you're home, you take care of this, okay? And so they would see him as the leader of the home. And um, so sometimes there were times, I remember one book we went through, and I just kind of typed up a little summary of the chapters and then gave them to him, and he did the teaching. He would look over it, and he would present it. And, you know. Let me just, just say also, and, and she never really understood this uh, too much. Uh, I was a pastor, you know, for many years, and I got to tell you, it was a lot easier to develop a sermon and to preach on Sunday and to do classes or to teach seminars at the Shepherds Conference every year. That was all easier than this. And it's like, I, I felt like I'm looking at him going, I don't know what to say. And, and she didn't, she was trying to say, well, you're a pastor. I mean, you, you teach something about the Bible. Yeah, but what? I can't think of anything, you know? And it's, it's embarrassing, you know? But uh, I've talked to many husbands that are like that. It's like, we want to do it, and so uh, I've, I've encouraged many wives along the way. What Pam did was so helpful, and just to, to give me some direction, some thoughts, and she would research some things and find some materials and stuff like that and, and type it up and, and say, I really think we need to talk about this or this, and yeah, it takes humility on the husband's part to, to be teachable, and, and then I could, I could run with that and go, Does yeah, she I, write the sermons for Twin She writes all my church. sermons. <laughs> Listen... I pretty much get all my stuff I teach from her, okay? And so I take her book and I just turn it out every Sunday, some form of that book. Thinking about but, those Shepherds Conference seminars I went to a little differently. <laughs> yes. But I, I remember those years and how helpful that was, and that was her ministry. It, it didn't mean that she did nothing. You know, it's like every member of the body of, of, the, the body of Christ has a responsibility to the church family and to serve. And to use your giftedness for the Lord. And so she did, but it was, it was measured depending on the ages of the children and, and what all was going on. And we're like any family, you know, it's like, okay, I think we just had a week where nobody is sick, you know, and so we can all go to church, you know. And then on Tuesday, when I'm sick again, you know, and you start the cycle over again. And now for the next five weeks, you know, she hasn't been in church. 
And I see that happening sometimes with families, and, and so the husband's staying home with the children so the wife can go to church. But I was a pastor, you know, I was teaching my, my, there on Sunday, so it was even harder. Uh, I couldn't always just help out with that, and she, she faithfully stayed committed to loving her children and loving her family and serving her husband. And as God gave you opportunities, there'd be times we'd do some counseling together or she would, she would have coffee with a lady in the church, a young woman, and just help her think through some things. She does a lot more of that now and leading women's ministries at the church and traveling and teaching and, and all that. But in those years, uh, you got to be very realistic and keep your expectations and, um, you know, realistic. Don't check out totally. That, that extreme of... You know, like I have no duties to my church family. No, you have responsibilities, but be wise about it. That's all. Yeah, it's not, I mean, it is not like I did nothing. I would say a lot of my ministry was still connected to the kids. Like, for instance, the kids were all in Awana. So I would help sometimes with Awana things, just, you know, going to listen to them say their scriptures. But it was connected to being there with my kids. Um, I just did various things, but a lot of it was connected to things that they were doing so I could be with them. Um, I, we did lead the music in one of our um, fellowship groups so I could play the piano, but my kids were all taken care of. They were in Sunday school, so it certainly wasn't taking me away from them. So you just use your gifts as... You know, you see needs, but you just have to be cautious about getting too overcommitted. And again, it's especially when you have little kids, babies, toddlers, little school age people. They will, they will never be that age again. Once that's gone, it's gone. Okay, they're grown up. And you never want to look back and just think of all the things you missed because you were too busy. You were doing this, you were doing that. So just make sure that you understand that when your kids are little, that is your main ministry. And, and I am very most, strong on that. That's your most powerful domain of influence, too. It doesn't matter. I mean, God may use you to do other things, but there's nothing more significant mm -hmm. than the impact that you have in your family and in your home. That is your, your most significant uh, domain and so never yeah. never diminish that and everything you do there is an act of worship and you have to think that way it, it doesn't matter how mundane the task is of changing diapers or washing dishes or, or getting meals ready or, or trying to get with some other ladies in the church to have play dates with the children I mean see everything as a you're doing this for the Lord uh, and you are Um, I was wondering if you guys could tell us a little bit more about the early marriage references you made. For example, like Carrie from your, per well, one question is how did you guys know you needed marriage counseling? And Carrie, what was your perspective on, what is your perspective looking back on that time period? Um, did you, did you know that you were not a believer when that started? And um, what would you want a group of women to, to take from your experience? If you could just sum that up in a nutshell, like how could you encourage us or any women here who may be married to someone who's not a believer or is struggling in their marriage? Well, my father was a pastor, and so I walked down an aisle when I was nine years old and was baptized and grew up in a home and knowing God and Scripture. And compared to the other kids at my junior high and high school, I was a good kid compared to them. You know, they would see me that way. But um, I also, uh, as I got older, got more involved in music. I formed a little band, or God kind of allowed this little band to form with two people, three people, four people, and it kept growing, and she married into the band in those years because we needed a keyboard player. And so, uh, <laughs> you know, all of that, I knew what to do, I knew what church was like, but there was a gnawing thing growing in me, I'd say through high school years when we'd have church camp and stuff like that, and, and God would be working in other kids' lives, and and people were growing and changing, and I just, I didn't understand that. It didn't apply to me. We got to college. 
We met at the University of Houston. I went to the Baptist Student Union because I was raised Baptist. She went to the Baptist Student Union. That's where she was raised, so we ended up meeting there. But I, I go there, and I'm, I'm running into college students who are, some of them, just really on fire for the Lord. I mean, taking their walk seriously in Bible study. And, and that, that was just not me. And I remember I was in pharmacy school, so I was very busy studying pharmacology and everything. That was my degree. But uh, they'd, they'd meet me and say, hey, you know, we're, we're going out witnessing on campus today. You know, you want to come with us? Share the Lord. It's like, oh, wow, I wish I could, but, you know, I've got a microbiology lab. And I was good at making up excuses to avoid all those things because at the bottom, at the end of the day, I'm just thinking, I don't want to do that. I mean, I don't even know how to do that. Why would I do that? Scared of that. Uh, What would I say to them? And so about the time we met, shortly thereafter, I kind of opened up to her that I was going through a real spiritual struggle So this is before we married. I remember even sharing that that it was such a crisis to me one night, I I decided to become an atheist. I I felt like that was going to be easier. So I actually told God that, So which is kind of paradoxical if you think about it, you know, but I'm (laughs) I'm telling the Lord in prayer, you know what? I think I'm not going to believe in you anymore, okay? (laughs) So leave me alone, you know? And uh, I was just depressed, I think, of wondering, what, what is wrong? But I got very involved then in the ministry of the Baptist Student Union, and they, I had some musical talent, and they, so they put me over the fine arts committee that would, we'd, students would go around to churches and do programs, and I was in a band anyway, so I knew what to say between the songs and what churches want to hear, and she got involved in the ministry as well. The difference was she had really gone through some spiritual struggles before coming there, and really was on a path now of pursuing the Lord, and I was on a path of really good at covering it all up again. So I could squash it all down, and I could convince myself everything was okay. I walked down an aisle when I was nine. My father was a pastor. I'm a good kid. I know the Bible. I, you know, it's just a thing I'm going through, and I'm not an atheist anymore, you know, and, and all that, and, and could function, even function to the point that we got more serious in our relationship and talking about the Lord, good enough at the hypocrisy and the covering it up that she couldn't really see through it. Of course, she was a, we know now, was a young believer, maybe not as discerning as she needed to be at the time, but to the point that, yeah, now we're in this band, the band's getting more popular, we're traveling around Houston and then South Texas, and I sang on television, I wrote some Christian songs for a a songwriting contest each year in the Houston area and would place in the finals, the final five each year. And they would be judged by, uh, by Amy Grant and people like that of the day. And, and uh, I could do all that. Uh, so I just squashed it all down again. I wrote the Christian vows for our wedding. And she certainly didn't intentionally marry an unbeliever. I recovered enough that everything was okay. And then I think probably within three months of marriage, she began to realize, because we're still traveling around on weekends and doing concerts and crusades and things, and she's beginning to realize something's wrong. You know, there's two different lives going on here, the public life, and I was a jerk. You know, I treated her miserably, and, and my sin got worse and worse, and yet living two different lives, and that that brought us to a place of a lot of turmoil because at first, when we first married, my father was still our pastor. Talking about going to marital counseling, we didn't. I wasn't going to go. Didn't want anybody to know. She didn't want anybody to know. We moved to another town, bought a pharmacy uh, for a few years and moved to a little town. And, and she got so desperate that she was going to counseling herself. Back in Houston, we were an hour away. I think it was in Houston she was going to, paying for some psychological sort of Christian counseling that we wouldn't even agree with today, but she was desperate. She didn't have anybody to talk to. And I was making life miserable for her. And so our life and our marriage was just spiraling down and getting worse and worse. And, and um, I'm sure she was at the end of her rope and trying to figure out what to do and, and um, praying for me. I'll answer your second question in a moment, but that's part of it. The bottom line is, at God's appointed time, I couldn't hide it anymore, and I couldn't deal with it anymore. And I was in a pharmacy in a small town, and I had a lady who worked for me, and I became, I would become so overwhelmed with my 
where I was and the kind of person I was, and, and she was loving me. She was being a good testimony for, before me. She sacrificed for me. And there, were, there was a couple of nights there in particular that I just, I couldn't understand, you know, what kind of person I had become. I, I, I didn't know what love was. And um, I was miserable. And I got to a point where I'd be filling prescriptions and I couldn't even concentrate. And I'd go into my little warehouse part of the building, and i just weep. And I lived down the street, Main Street, we did, and I'd leave the lady in charge, which I think was illegal, but I did it. And I went down because I couldn't function. I'd go to my, my house and just pour out my heart and just, please forgive me. I, I, I don't even know what I am. That was God bringing me to the end of myself and helping me see myself the way he saw me of what sin is and what repentance is and what it really means to follow Christ. And I couldn't tell you there were so many of those moments in my warehouse or at my little house just pouring out my heart to the Lord, please forgive me, change me. Um, I don't know when I was saved. The Lord knows. All I know is a new season began to slowly build and I began to put things out of my life that didn't belong and, and try to learn what it meant to be a husband and what love meant and so on and so forth. And so God brought me to understand myself the way he saw me. That's the bottom line, you know. And it was some teaching. Along the way, through all this misery, a relative, one of our relatives, her brother-in-law kind of called her and said, hey, this is in the late 70s, you know, back in the dark ages, you know, before electricity and everything. But uh, <laughs> Somebody called her, a brother-in-law, and said, hey, there's this guy on the radio. He's from California, and he teaches the Bible like I haven't really heard anybody teach before. You ought to listen to it. Of course, I'm thinking, <laughs> a radio preacher. Yeah, I want to listen to that every morning. But she started listening to Grace to You Radio and John MacArthur in 1978, 79. I had to listen by default. And um, I'm hearing the Bible in a way I'd never heard before. That was one factor. We got involved in some other seminars that we went to of, of a man who was teaching. I wouldn't agree with everything today, but some of the things he was teaching about sin and repentance, God used that. The pressure of my sin, all of that, God just used. But God also used her patient testimony. And so to answer your second question, what, what do you do? Well, the, your directions are in Scripture. First Peter 3, you know, one and following. There's your marching orders. That's what she did. I'm not saying she did it perfectly. She wouldn't claim that, but she still sought to love me. She still sought to sacrifice for me. She sought to uh, be a good testimony of serving the Lord and being faithful to the Lord, pray for me. She kept a prayer journal. She still does in many ways, but <laughs> that, that prayer journal, you know, it had a section for the kids and each of the, you know, at that time, you know, maybe we, start, we had just had our first child, so a little section for her, a big section for me that was about this thick, you know, several books of what she was praying and and uh, that God would change me, and I didn't know that at the time. That's what you do. Uh, it's hard. It's not easy. But you, you love your husband, and 1 Peter 3, 1 says, you know, that if, even if your husband is disobedient to the word, and I think the primary application there is to an unbeliever. I think there is application to a, believing, a believer who's in sin as well, the husband, but the first application is this is a man who's disobedient to the word as, as a life. And she saw the hypocrisy, my public life and the band and churches and yet how I treated her at home. And, uh, but she lived a testimony before me. And uh, she, she sought to be respectful. And it says there, and he may be one. It doesn't say he will. It's not a guarantee, but he may be one as he sees your chaste and respectful behavior he may be one without a word from the wife. So she didn't put tracks on my pillow, you know, and she didn't put tracks in my briefcase and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, but um, she certainly prayed for me and she tried to live a godly life in all her confusion, trying to figure out what to do and longing for somebody to talk to. And, uh, you know, we, there, there were people in our lives that should have confronted us, you know, and they didn't. We were not in an environment that understood body life and church discipline and all those kind of verses. We were not in that environment. But uh, the Lord still honored his purposes for our lives. And I uh, wouldn't say our marriage changed immediately, but 
over the years, uh, certainly changed enough. And I've told people before, you know, I began to grow. Fortunately, God gave us a pharmacy that had no customers hardly, so there wasn't much business. <laughs> so I had lots of time during the day. I would read because now I began to realize I, I want my life to be different. In fact, I want the Bible that I know. I want to impact how I live. How, do, how does it do that? That was new to me. And John MacArthur, somebody would recommend a, a book or whatever. I'd get the book and I'd read it. And some other radio program we listen to recommend, you know, read The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. All right, order The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. And that, that book opened up my, my mind to, wow, there's a, there's a bigger God here than I, than I, than I realize. I need to know. I want to know him. And we got more involved in ministry in our little country church in the town where we lived. And so I began to grow. And somewhere in there, after about three years, by God's grace, our, our marriage had changed enough, and I had changed enough that I was reading a book on discipleship and just realized, I think, I think I want to do that. My heart's in that. So I went home one day and told her, I said, you better sit down. You're not going to believe this, <laughs> but I think I want to go in the ministry. And that was a very important day for us. that uh, she said, I can follow you in the ministry. And so that charted a path for us. Sold my pharmacy, and we went into ministry for a while, and several years, and more growth, and her still sorting through some things, and um, me uh, still learning how to be a husband, but growing and changing theologically. And finally, after five or six more years of that, then we moved to California to go to, go to seminary. So... That was a very important day that she would be able to say there had been enough change. So I'm not hesitant to tell wives, this is what you do. This is what God's told you to do. There's not another way. All the other ways are manipulation, and they don't work. You know, not only are they sinful, but they don't work. They'll push your husband even farther away. This is what you do, 1 Peter 3, 1 and following. Thank you. Well, our, our time is gone. Melissa, do you have closing statements or do I close us in prayer and dismiss us? Okay. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this wonderful weekend. Uh, we pray to have your mind, your heart, your balance on all the tensions that tug on our lives. Uh, we know that the things that you, by your good and sovereign hand, put in our lives are not enemies with one another. They are your friends. They are your allies for our good and for your glory. We pray to hold them in the tensions that you would direct us from in your word. Give us strength and endurance for the short time we have on this earth that we might be faithful before you. We thank you for the Hardys and for their investment uh, in our own lives and uh, in us in our church this weekend. We pray that it would bear much fruit in Jesus' name. Amen.